My name is Julia Mangoferrer, and I have the immense privilege to be the chair of the Tyler Prize Executive Committee, the committee that was set up in 1973 when the Tyler Prize was the brainchild of John and Alice Tyler, who, if you remember, in 1973, not too many people were speaking about the environment. It was a year after the Stockholm Conference, and who decided to set up this prize to recognize work about understanding and solving the challenges facing our Earth system. So that, and, and we have an executive committee, I'll introduce you to them in a minute, and we look after the Tyler Prize, we look after the legacy of the vision of the Tylers, and then we have this very challenging and wonderful job of selecting the laureates. We, since 1973, we've had 72 individuals and four organizations recognized as the Tyler Prize laureates. And when I was at the International Council for Science, ICSU, we always thought of the Tyler Prize as the Nobel Prize for the Environment, and I, I think it still is. So by when this, when this evening is over, and we will have formally made Paul Falkowski and Jim McCarthy our laureates, there'll be 74 individuals and four organizations on the record, and this Tyler Prize will live on forever and ever until, of course, we all become good stewards of the environment. I hope you don't mind, Paul, that I'm putting human beings also as stewards next to your microbes, and maybe one day the Tyler Prize Committee can say we don't need this prize anymore, but I'm not sure that we're there yet. So, I, I, first of all, I think this is the first time that we are in the AAAS headquarters, and we really wanted to be here in this house of science. And I want to thank Rush Holt, the CEO, for welcoming us and for making this possible, and also Shirley Malcolm, who I know did an awful lot behind the scenes. So it's a, it's a very good thing to be in this house of science, to begin our celebrations with a scientific lecture. So we have in the room also three of the past laureates, John Holdren, Stuart Pym, Diana Wall, I don't think Hal Mooney is here yet. I don't see him. And those are, those are people who've already been recognized, and it's wonderful that they're with us. Let me just uh, introduce you to the Tyler Prize Executive Committee. First of all, I'm supposed to say two things that are kind of administrative. Turn your phones off, please. And the second thing is they deserve your applause, but applaud at the very end. So Rosina Bierbaum, who's very much involved. Uh, Rosina, why don't you stand up so people can see you. It's, uh, Rosina Bierbaum, uh, Maggie Catley Carson, another foreigner along with me from Canada. Alan Kovic, Ezekiel Escura, another foreigner from Mexico. Owen Lind, who has been, where are you, Owen? There, Owen Lind, who's been on the committee since 1973. He knows everything, and I stepped into his shoes as chair. Judy McDowell, Judy there, Jonathan Patz, and Kelly Sims Gallagher. So we've got this wonderful group. Now you can clap if you want. <laughs> so I just want to say, I'm not going to give a scientific lecture, but I'm going to co-moderate this, but I am so glad that we have recognized with this prize, and we've done it before, but not enough, the importance of 72% of our planet. And I think that's about right. That's, it's a lot. It's our blue planet, and we need that ocean to be healthy. So let me now just introduce our moderator, Kasha Patel, who is a science journalist who works at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and uh, where she reports on the latest NASA climate research and satellite imagery. So, uh, so Kasha is already a great science communicator, but she's also an on-screen personality and a stand-up comedian. And she is particularly works on, on the lighter side of science. And I have to say, Kasha, that I've always thought that we have a choice of just being incredibly depressed and look at the issues in, but obviously none of you are because you woke up this morning and you came here. And, or we need to see the lighter side and there are solutions and their way forward. So Kasha, please come up here and thank you very much for co-moderating this with us. Good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone doing? Did you guys have a good lunch? Good. Uh, I noticed that they serve shrimp out there, but in honor of this lecture, we did not serve any phytoplankton. So, 
Um, I always get nervous when people introduce me as a comedian of some sorts because people automatically want to hear something funny or hear a joke, which is kind of unfair, right? Because like I've never walked up to a chemist and said, hey, balance his redox reaction for me, although maybe I should. Uh, this is a very fancy lecture. I'm very proud to be uh, the moderator for this. Thank you so much for asking me. Um, this, uh, I think the terminology was to dress business casual, so I'm very glad uh, to see. I was worried that some scientists would show up in uh, blue jeans and a shirt, because I know that's what you guys work as in terms of your lab and your business. So. Um, I will say thank you, Julie, for the introduction. I am a science writer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I work in the Earth Science Department, um, which, as I need to, I don't need to tell you guys this, but uh, it exists. <laughs> Most people that I talk to uh, don't realize that NASA studies Earth. Um, so when I tell them that I work at NASA, they're so excited, and they immediately want to know if I'm an astronaut. Um, and then I tell them I work in the Earth Science Department, and then you can just see like the level of disappointment of, like, I'm not an astronaut. Um, it's like, you know, if someone comes up to you and says, like, hi, I'm from Paris, Texas, you know, it's just kind of a bit of a letdown. But I really love my job, and I actually think I need to thank our laureates today for my job because part of my job is to look at satellite imagery, and one of my favorite images are phytoplankton blooms. No matter where it is in the world, no matter how big or small it is, to me it's some of the prettiest satellite imagery that you can see. And I actually have a picture, a big a banner of it in my house. So every day I wake up and I just see these phytoplankton blooms there. Um, so thank you very much for your research and my new wall decoration. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker today. Um, he is one of the biggest pioneers in ocean biology. Um, he, uh, he studies the biological processes controlling ocean productivity, primarily focusing on phytoplankton, uh, coral, and primary production. When I talked to him earlier, uh, I didn't know this, but he actually is the reason that some of our NASA satellites, like sea whiffs, uh, he helped develop the algorithm of why we can measure phytoplankton from space, which to me has like revolutionized how we study ocean biology. Um, he was also, back in the 1970s, he was one of the first scientists to observe how climate influences these microbial communities in the ocean. He was one of the first scientists to do that, which to me just means he's been way more depressed about climate change longer than any of us. So thank you for that. Um, he also, uh, it wasn't, he did have a chance to take a different path after he got his PhD in biology. He had the choice to either work in a medical school in Canada or going to sea as an oceanographer. And I can just imagine that must have been a very very difficult choice of whether he should stay in the lab where it's dark around sick things or into the open ocean where there's sun all the time uh, where he has fresh air. Um, so as we all know, we are thankful he chose the latter. But in very true Canadian fashion, he did say sorry. So thank you for that. Um, I asked Dr. Paul Fakowski why he chose to study phytoplankton in the oceans. And he said it's not because they're cute, although he did admit some of them are cute. Um, it's because of its importance on our ecosystem. That, I mean, can you just imagine a world where we didn't have phytoplankton or if our oceans weren't working? I mean, so many things would kind of fall apart. So uh, that's especially why I'm interested in listening to his lecture. So I would like to introduce the lecture of a Fragile Species, How Earth's Oceans Impact Our Future. As we know, Earth's oceans play a crucial role in creating and sustaining a livable community for uh, humanity. Yet, oceans and the marine microbes they contain remain little known and underappreciated even amongst the climate science community. So uh, please welcome Dr. Paul Falkowski. Thank you very much, Kasha and Julia, and everybody else that's here. Am I good? Mm -hmm. All right. 
So I'm going to talk today, um, if I am up on the screen, there we go, thank you, uh, about the role of phytoplankton in the global carbon cycle. And for those of you who don't know what the word phytoplankton means, the, the word plankton is, in Greek, the derivation is the same as planet, it means to drift. Uh, and phyto just means something that derives its life from the sun. Um, now, as Julia alluded, uh, there's 72%, 71.5% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, which makes us the pale blue dot. And this is uh, not a fake photograph. This is a real photograph from the Apollo missions. And looking at Earth, you see all the major aspects of it. You see continents, which were not originally part of the Earth when it was formed at 4.5 billion years. Where did the water come from? It came from comets. The Earth has had liquid water on its surface for its entire history, with ex the exception of a few periods when it, there was a slush ball or a snowball. But those are rare, and we haven't had one of those in the last 750 million years. So liquid water is the only major characteristic of this planetary body at present. Mars had liquid water. It's no longer liquid. And there's no other planetary body in our solar system like it. If I took all the water and put it into a ball, that's how much volume it would contain. So this is a very fragile planet. It's amazing that we've maintained this water for so many billions of years. Now, why do I care about water? Water contains two hydrogen atoms with an oxygen. <coughs> and in the presence of light, and only in the presence of light can that molecule be split and form sugar. So this process is carried out by photosynthetic organisms that produce oxygen. And you and I are sitting in the room, and we're taking the sugar that we ate, in effect, and combining it with oxygen in the room, which is coming from water, and we're breathing out two gases, carbon dioxide, of course, but also water vapor. So the entire life cycle, and we generate energy from that process. So you and I and every other heterotroph, or organism that eats something else, is actually consuming energy from the sun. We're making our bodies from stored solar energy through the photosynthetic reaction. How does that photosynthetic reaction work? Believe it or not, when I was nine years old at the Museum of Planetarium, I went to the planetarium in, in, in New York at the Museum of Natural History, and it was explained to me when I was nine in my class that we have oxygen on Earth, and I was really excited. I went home and I lit a match for my mother, and I said, you see, we couldn't do this on Mars. We couldn't light a match. <laughs> and I thought somebody knew how some organisms made oxygen. Well, here I am, I'm 67 years old, and believe it or not, we still do not understand that process. In any event, we know the process began in a group of organisms called cyanobacteria. And this is one photograph, micrograph, taken in my lab, uh, of an organism that Jim McCarthy and I and Doug Capone and many other people study, and it's called trichodesmium. And this organism can produce oxygen and also fix nitrogen. But there are many, 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 many of these organisms in the ocean. And they evolved some time ago. And here is where we come to a dirty secret, which we shouldn't tell the children. We don't know when. We don't know exactly when. They could have evolved 3.5 billion years ago. They could have evolved 2.8 billion years ago. And some people even think they evolved 2.5 billion years ago. And I'll explain to you why that's important in a bit. In any event, those organisms were engulfed by other organisms that were heterotrophs, and they created the modern eukaryotic phytoplankton. So this is a diatom. It has a wall of silica. This is a single cell. And those little dots inside are engulfed at ancestral cyanobacteria, which we call plastids, or chloroplasts in higher plants. And here's another type of organism. This is a dinoflagellate, and this is a coccolithophore. Now, coccolithophores produce calcium carbonate, the chalk, cliffs of Dover are the most famous examples of them. So this is a single cell. 
These are the lists. It's going from <clears throat> two different phases of its life cycle. That's why there are two different kinds of, of lists on it. So if I look here, oxygenic photosynthesis began in these cyanobacteria, and they're the only clade of prokaryotic organisms that ha are capable of that reaction. And the same exact reaction was engulfed and contained in many, many different groups of eukaryotic algae, and including land plants, which are over here. So land plants are derived from one single cyanobac uh, eukaryotic algal cell that came onto land approximately 450 million years ago. So if you're studying land plants, you're wasting your time. You should really be going back and looking at the phytoplankton. Now, why are phytoplankton important? OK, <clears throat> they evolved oxygen at 2.3 billion years. And then again, another group of organisms, another group of algae, created the second burst of oxygen, which made it possible for animal life to exist. And we can see these algae from space, which is what Kasia was saying. And here is a movie of the annual cycle of productivity from space for land and the ocean. You're literally watching the ocean and land breathe. Now here's the, the big deal. The phytoplankton of the ocean are less than 1% of the total photosynthetic biomass on Earth. So 99.8% of the photosynthetic biomass is terrestrial ecosystem, mostly in wood. And these are not wood. These are big bags of enzymes that fix carbon and make sugar and make another cell. And when you take the productivity of them, they account for about 40, almost half of the productivity of the planet. So less than 1% of the biomass, of photosynthetic biomass, is responsible for almost half of the productivity of the planet, whereas the other 99.8% is responsible for the other half. That's remarkable. So here's the real deal. At the end of the day, these cells don't produce seeds. They divide every five days, and one daughter cell has to persist for these organisms to exist for millions and millions of years. It's an amazing phenomenon that has occurred for billions of years. And several years ago, my colleagues, Max Gorbanoff is sitting here, and Zbysha Kolber, who's not with me anymore in terms of being in my group, we developed instruments that could measure fluorescence. I'm not going to go through the process of it, but these are the toys that Max made. And we developed these techniques in the early 1980s, and then we could drive them all over the planet. And so we could go from Plymouth to the Falkland Islands. And this is the photosynthetic efficiency all across that cruise track, thousands of kilometers. Now with that, we could make maps of the productivity of Earth in situ and correlate them with productivity of the planet from space. And so we rewrote those algorithms that allow you to derive productivity of the planet from the ocean. And Compton Tucker and Chris Field wrote them algorithms for the terrestrial ecosystem. And that's how we got that half-half mix. So I just want to make the final conclusion that phytoplankton are responsible for uh, almost half of the primary productivity of Earth. And they changed the planet. So they evolved over 2.5 billion years ago and fundamentally these organisms, I would argue, are the most profound organisms to change the planet in the history of Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I stand corrected. Uh, he did show us a redox reaction. <laughs> so... <laughs> All right, so our next presenter, uh, when I talked to Jim before this, I asked him, uh, why do you like studying the ocean? Um, and he didn't quite say because it's cute. Uh, but he did stress one part about how interdisciplinary it is, which I thought was very interesting, because he told me that you know you have biology, you have geology, you have chemistry, then you have biogeochemistry, which to me kind of sounded redundant. but. You also have public policy. And that's why I like uh, how Paul and Jim were picked together, because I think now in today's world, 
we're learning that you can't really have one without the other. You need to have your advocates for science, and you also need to have your advocates for public policy. Um, so, I mean, Jim has so many things that he's done, including being uh, the co-chair for the IPCC's uh, 2001 assessment. He was a former AAAS president, so I don't know if being back here brings back good memories or bad memories, but hopefully we'll create some new memories here. He's actually spent 47 years in the field of biological oceanography, and I think that he might have one of his hardest tasks coming up here right now, uh, summarizing all of his work in 10 minutes. So uh, please, let's welcome Jim McCarthy. Thank you, Kasha, and uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm happy you're here. So I would like to uh, pick up on this theme that Paul began. It's sort of interesting. Our careers, actually, were just, just beginning when the Tyler, uh, Alice and John Tyler decided to create this prize. So, so we've, we've ridden through this period and seen extraordinary advances in ocean science. A lot of that came about because there was a growing interest in trying to understand how our planet was changing. There were reasons to expect that the understanding of climate, for example, uh, could be fleshed out with a better understanding of the ocean. And it appeared in that period in the early 80s that climate was changing in unusual ways. It was also a period when a lot of the interdisciplinary work that Kasia mentioned was uh, was coming into vogue. That is, we realized that in order to understand what was happening on this planet, uh, you needed to use a multi-pronged approach, uh, not just physical or just biological or biogeochemical, but, uh, but one that involved them all. <clears throat> so um, this revolution that Paul referred to, and again, apologies for the dark slides here, uh, they don't show up nearly as well as they do on the laptop. Um, this, um, this is a region where one can see the pulsing of this spring bloom that uh, Paul was referring to with the global map. And this is the North Atlantic spring bloom uh, off the British Isles and south of Iceland. And you see the colors, this, this is sped up. So this is an annual cycle in about four or five seconds. And then you see these large open ocean areas that remain sort of persistently blue without this seasonality. It doesn't show up, uh, oh, I'm sure you can't see it at all now, but there's a, another little ellipse over in the right around the Black Sea. And if you could see it closely enough, you would see that on the, even on the western, northwestern shore of the Black Sea, there's also this pulsing seasonal bloom. Closer to home, here's what a satellite image looks like or the chlorophyll concentration along our eastern seaboard. So we see the Chesapeake Bay here uh, along the coast, right into the Gulf of Maine. This is the spring bloom. Again, the reds are the highest concentration, then the yellows, the greens, and the blue are the persistent low concentrations. And notice also this wavy northern boundary of the Gulf Stream, which shows these undulations. The Gulf Stream makes these undulations and occasionally pinches off into a, what we call a ring. And here's a cold core ring because the water came from here. And here's a warm core ring because the core water came from here. These rings persist for, for months. In fact, we have followed them with a series of expeditions. The warm rings move back down this way. And the satellite imagery is essential in order to conduct a study like this, in order to be able to be in the ring with your ship know where the center is, and to be able to follow it between your expeditions. And over time, the waters in the core changed because they're now in a different environment. They came from the Sargasso Sea. They're now in the environment of slope water. So we can follow how plankton evolve under these different conditions. So I want to talk from this point on about what happens to those phytoplankton in the sea. So phytoplankton production nourishes zooplankton. And the phytoplankton 
because Paul said double every couple of days. And the zooplankton include two size categories. They're very small ones, which actually are about the size of the largest phytoplankton. And they eat the smallest phytoplankton. And those small zooplankton, along with the larger phytoplankton, are eaten by larger zooplankton. We call them mesoplankton, mesozooplankton. Now these small microzooplankton release their feces and detritus in extremely small particles. And those right away produce new nutrients for the phytoplankton. However, the larger zooplankton produce feces and detritus that sinks quickly into the deep sea and to the deep sea bed. So this phytoplankton production nourishes zooplankton, which in turn facilitates the export of carbon to the deep sea. And we call this overall process the biological pump, which beginning with CO2 dissolved in surface water leads to photosynthesis, zooplankton bacteria, sinking of detritus, and ultimately organic carbon added to the deep sea and deep seabed. And this cartoon just shows those processes in more detail. Now there's another side of this, which is where much of my own research has been. And that's to understand how different nutrients contribute to the development of this pathway. So here are the phytoplankton, the zooplankton. And the waste products from this metabolism ends up as ammonium and urea in the near-surface waters. And this turns over very rapidly. It's produced and used about as fast as, it, as it's produced. However, the material that went into the deep water then, sorry, you can't see this, but the ammonium gets oxidized to nitrate. And that's a much longer cycle. Whereas this one takes a few days, this one can take decades to centuries. And then circulation and ocean currents bring this back uh, to the surface. So the biological pump not only takes carbon into the deep sea, it also takes nitrogen down to fuel this part of the cycle. Now this is, um, the most intense data slide I'm going to show, so bear with me. Here's the North Pacific, here's the equator, and here's the South Pacific. And up on this axis is the fraction of the total phytoplankton in two different categories. Now, for reference, Hawaii is up about here, 20 degrees north. Tahiti is about 17 south. You know, a six-week expedition. You've got to start somewhere interesting and end somewhere interesting. So. <laughs> Why not Hawaii and Tahiti? So in the north, if you look at this very low abundance of a large phytoplankton, and in this case, there were diatoms, and notice it's very low in the north, very low in the south, but right along the equator, where you have this nitrate-rich water coming to the surface, it heated up to about 20, 25%. And here's another little peak here. In contrast, the smallest phytoplankton here, one genus called Prochlorococcus. In the north, almost half. In the south, almost a quarter. But right along the equator, it drops to a few percent. So here's the organism that's thriving on that deep upwelled nitrate. These are thriving on the ammonium and urea that is recycled near surface. Now here's that big diatom. By comparison, watch this dot. That would be the size of the Prochlorococcus, the small cell. This is just a, a detailed scheme of the nitrogen budget for the Black Sea, which includes all those processes worked out with high resolution based on work we did in that water. Now I'm going to shift to a, a twist on this. So we talked about how zooplankton and fish contribute to the biological pump. But whales, not so much. And why is that? Well, <clears throat> here's the export of carbon uh, to the deep sea. But whales feed at depth. They come back to the surface where they must come because they're mammals. They have to breathe air. But while at the surface, they do all their digestion. And believe it or not, that the feces of whales are minuscule little particles with bacteria working on their surface, 
So those get remineralized and replaced with these processes rapidly into ammonium. So here's an exception to the animal really contributing to the export, the depth, it's keeping nutrients near the surface. And if you look at another representation of how the whales can move nutrients around, <clears throat> whales that feed in these northern latitudes or high southern latitudes, or they're breeding and they're calving, they move to more temperate here and here, and these, I'm sorry, these go here, these go here, uh, these go here, the more temperate and tropical waters. So the whales actually move nitrogen from the, from the phytoplankton they've eaten at these high latitudes, which are rich and productive, uh, to lower latitudes where the nutrients are more scarce. So in summary, the source and form of nitrogen nutrients helps determine whether small size or large size phytoplankton thrive. And the pathway of phytoplankton consumption, large or small zooplankton, determines what form of nitrogen will be available for further phytoplankton production. And these processes affect the rate of the biological pump, which transfers CO2 dissolved in the upper ocean to the deep ocean as detritus, stored carbon, and thus reduces the amount of greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere. In some region, whales help retain and redistribute nitrogen and other nutrients in the upper ocean and thereby enhance phytoplankton production. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move to the question and answer, answer portion. Um, so, Paul, if you would like to take a seat, and Joel, if you'd like to take a seat to help co-moderate. Um, if you have a question, we have these microphones here. You can raise your hand. Also, if you like Twitter, you can use the hashtag uh, TylerPrize2018, and we can do it that way. Um, so let's get started. We'll be doing this for a little bit, and I have a few questions to start us off while you guys think of your own. You have to hold the bottom. Oh, there we go. That works. All right. So, Paul, you wrote six books. In one of your books, uh, your book, uh, Life's Engines, you say that phytoplankton are the stewards of the planet. Why do you say phytoplankton are the stewards of the planet? It's a little more general than phytoplankton, but uh, micro microbes are the stewards of the planet. So you have to think about this in a way of the evolution of life on Earth. For the first, up until approximately 2.3 billion years ago, there was no oxygen. And um, it's what I call the research and development phase of Earth's history. <laughs> this is when we got all the major metabolisms on Earth. Uh, and then oxygenic photosynthesis was one of the very last, followed by aerobic respiration, which was the last. And all of those, all of those were created in microbes. So um, as one eukaryote speaking to others, <laughs> we're frankly not very different from E. coli. We just are big E. coli with brains and mobility. <laughs> so <laughs> in effect, we have... A, Eukaryotes have not invented any unique metabolism. They have appropriated a small subset of metabolisms from microbes, and that's it. So life before human beings depended totally on microbes for nitrogen fixation, processing of methane, both in the production of methane and the consumption of methane. Everything was done by microbes that made the world possible. Then, of course, micro we exceeded the capacity of microbial metabolism to provide food for us in terms of nitrogen fixation, for example. And very famously, Haber, Fritz Haber, invented the reaction that fixes nitrogen. We developed systems that got us methane from the ground, uh, which we use today to fuel our homes and fuel other things, our electricity systems. And so we are exceeding the capacity of what natural microbes have done to our 
I think, detriment or at least at some point in the short term, um, uh, we're borrowing time for, an, uh, for a pathway to sustainability. And I think this is where the problem of the Tyler vision and the actual human condition intersects. Continue, but before I, I do, I, I, I guess since the Tylers couldn't, we couldn't invite a microbe or a couple of microbes to get the Tyler Prize, you're <coughs> representing them yeah. as the stewards. So, um, Jim, I have a question for you, and you're not going to be surprised about where I'm going with this question, and that is about policy and policy influencing. So your career has involved this great research. I don't quite know how you do the 24 hours, how, how you can do so much in 24 hours. But you've also been involved in science policy from the, having been president here, of course, the union, having been president of the Union of Concerned Scientists, then getting involved in the early days of the <coughs> International Geosphere Biosphere Program, a study of global change, IGBP. I think you and I may be among the few who still remember what that acronym is, but it was very important. And then, of course, the IPCC. So I, I'd like to ask you how you see your work as a biological oceanographer as having informed or motivated your pathway to policy influencing and advocacy. Thank you, Julia. Um, it, it, it's something I've uh, often wondered about myself as to how this actually happened. And, and I suppose um, it, it was in part that uh, initial draw to the interdisciplinary nature of the problems and and I was mentioning to Kasha earlier, it's one of the things that drew me to ocean science was that you really did need to approach these problems from multiple perspectives. And the realization that um, the more you examine, the more you realize how connected they are. So uh, Paul just mentioned methane. Um, where does methane come from? It's that buried photosynthesis. And where do we stick uh, holes in the ground to find oil and and the gas associated with it. They're ancient marine sediments. So all the oil we burn and much of the methane associated with oil comes because we have the biological pump and it's taking carbon into the deep sea and burying it and it's ancient inland seas that are now, uh, you know, the, the middle of this country in the Arabian Peninsula where you find this material. So the realization that, that there's an understanding of how um, as Paul was describing the history of these processes, how we got to where we are today. And, and the, the notion that an understanding of that helps you better appreciate some of the decisions that we have to make today as a society and, and their implications. The fact that we're taking that process that Paul diagrammed for photosynthesis and respiration and then taking stuff out of the ground, that ancient photosynthesis, and running it backwards much faster than would happen without human intervention. So the, for me also, I think it was the uh, a fascination with boundaries. And, and so I remember when we were in the mid 80s formulating the, uh, the program for the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. And I realized as we met with colleagues who were atmospheric chemists and, and, and uh, 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 terrestrial ecologists and people who were working on ice cores that, and solar historians, that, that most of them had not had the same experience that oceanographers had with interdisciplinary connections. And it was a harder reach for many of them to figure out how to bridge uh, the terrestrial ecology and atmospheric chemistry, for example, whereas in the oceans, the, the biology of the ocean and the chemistry of, of the water was, 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 it was all seamless. And so I guess, you know, I found it attractive that some of those experiences with the interdisciplinary connection and then the boundaries, well, once you've got uh, the ocean you, and, you, and you connect to the atmosphere and, and you're connecting to the history, all that, and the sediments. And then, of course, another boundary is, is how we use that information society today to, to uh, inform policy and to implement policies that fully incorporate this understanding. So uh, going off your last sentence that you just said, this is for both of you, what do you guys think are the biggest misconceptions that politicians and the public have about the ocean's role 
in our climate on Earth? Well, uh, I don't think they understand the role at all, and I think because there's no voting, <laughs> no votes in the ocean, uh, most of ocean policy can be completely ignored. And so you have uh, that massive problems around the world. We have, uh, obviously, the ocean garbage dump in the Pacific. We have massive eutrophication uh, of coastal waters around the world. We have massive exploitation of coral reefs. Um, there's no perception. I mean, the amount of overfishing on the planet today is phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal because there's no... In the United States coastal waters, we have the National Marine Fisheries Service that regulates very well, I think, uh, the consumption of fish and by species. But there's no international rules that say these are the amount of tuna that we can sustainably ex extract from the ocean. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, politicians really are kind of I think blind to these problems. In addition to many other environmental problems, this is one of a, of a planopy of environmental problems that I think uh, is not up in, in, the, in the front uh, and in the face of most politicians. Rush probably is nodding, I guess, that that's, that's, that's true. I fully agree with Paul. I think uh, most uh, people who are in positions of uh, responsible for policy in this country and the U.S. Congress, for example, um, have no sense of how the ocean really works. They have no sense of these sorts of processes, the biological pump, that the, the oil that we're using is, is, is ancient photosynthesis, right? phytoplankton buried in the deep ocean. Um, the, the, the recognition of, of other sort of major problems in the ocean uh, one that scientists are very aware of today, and uh, unfortunately a few people in the U.S. Congress, that of the changing chemistry of the ocean, which referred to in the vernacular as ocean acidification, which, which uh, works against that precipitation of calcium carbonate. Paul showed the coccoliths on the coccolith of Florida, or, or corals or shells of mollusk. Uh, most, um, most people um, who are in positions to make decisions in the policy realm of the ocean have no sense of that. Most of them don't realize that a third of the carbon dioxide that we're releasing to the atmosphere with our industrial and land use practices uh, is absorbed by the ocean. Um, most don't realize that, that over 90% of the heat that is now in our system because of the greenhouse gases we've added to the atmosphere is in the ocean. It's not in temperature over land. It's not in land surface. It's actually being stored in the ocean. And the ocean so is this very, very important regulator of these master uh, processes, and and I, I think it's uh, it's something that that is just not at all appreciated by by most people who haven't taken some time to really look carefully at ocean science. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask a question to you. Paul, I also don't know how you can do so much in 24 hours. You are currently also the director of Rutgers Energy Institute. Yes. So with that background, what do you think it will take to switch to a carbon neutral planet? Well, you have a huge investment in fossil fuels and the fossil fuel delivery systems are very well entrenched. So let me just go back to think about this a little bit. So in 1859, the bells of what was not then called Big Ben rang for the first time. Abraham Lincoln would be elected president for the United States. On November 24th of 1859, the very first edition of The Origin of Species, the first printing, would be published. It was a stocking stuffer. That's why it was published in November of 1859, so you could buy it <laughs> and give it, give it to your, your wife or your friends for Christmas. I'm not joking. At the same time, in Titusville, for, uh, Pennsylvania, Edwin Drake dug and the first oil well. And what was the gimmick? 
he lined the well with what would be like pipe, so it wouldn't collapse. Why would you put an oil well in the ground in 1859? Nuts, right? Well, what was done with the oil was it was distilled and you made kerosene. And the kerosene was then a substitute fuel for oil lamps. So think about this for a moment. Where did we get oil for the oil lamps before that? Whales. So in a very funny way, so this goes to a, another story. Ro Robert Dietz in Brooklyn created an oil lamp that was flameless using the kerosene from Drake. And he sold these en masse to the city of Brooklyn. And he was the Steve Jobs of his day. He made a fortune. Drake, by the way, died a pauper. Now, this became standard oil, and in the 1870s, Daimler invented the internal combustion engine. And the gimmick here was they were throwing away what was gasoline because it had no use. So all of a sudden, you had a cheap fuel based on the distillation of oil to make kerosene. Now, okay, you have this engine. Think about this, from 1880 to 1920, all of a sudden Ford created a factory that could make cars repetitively through the assembly line process. We built out roads, we built out infrastructure for delivering the fuel, for making the tires, for everything that we needed to do to supply the transportation industry, and simultaneously Thomas Alva Edison created a fuel, uh, a electricity supply for the city of Brooklyn again. City of Brooklyn was very advanced. Okay, the city of Brooklyn, and I don't know, but just as a funny aside here, of course you're familiar with the Tesla Edison arguments about AC versus DC electricity and so on, but the city of Brooklyn had a trolley system which was powered by electricity, and it would arc. And every once in a while, somebody would get in the middle of the arc on the street and be sh electrocuted. So when the trolleys would come by, people would jump out of the way. And that's how we got the name the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> yes, really. <laughs> All right. So within less than 50 years, we, could, we totally transformed the planet based on a very simple fuel. And now the intransigence of the developed countries to develop alternative fuel supplies is mind-boggling to me. It's absolutely mind-boggling. But it's going to happen. So we are going to have solar energy. We're going to have, uh, we're going to have wind energy. We will develop at some point some kid in the dark room somewhere in a university, not where I wanted to be, <laughs> will figure out how to split water with a catalyst that is using earth-abundant minerals, and they will make hydrogen gas. And those processes, on their ensemble, will change the planet. We're looking, when we're driving gasoline-powered cars today, those are clipper ships. Those are going to become extinct. Um, and we can make, using algal biomass, we can make transportation fuels. So there is a way out of this. We just, not have, we just have not monetized it. We have not incentivized it, and that's a policy issue. It is not a technology issue. Um, we'll take a question from the audience. Thank you, and first I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate both of you, so well-deserved. Um, I'd like to pick up on this um, idea of where we're going forward and um, ask both of you to comment on... Um, the oceans with respect to your um, insights of the biological pump, et cetera, and many of the uh, ocean bioengineering solutions that have been put forward with respect to uh, capturing carbon and get your take on some of those, for example, iron fertilization or urea fertilization of the oceans. Of all the all the schemes that um, could be imagined or have been 
quasi seriously discussed. I think fertilization of the ocean is uh, is one of the most ridiculous. Um, it 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 it, um, it assumes that uh, if you were to add uh, the only nutrient that that could conceivably be applied in large scale because of cost, that would be uh, not nitrogen, that'd be far too expensive, phosphorus far too expensive, but a, a trace element in this case. Um, in some parts of the world's ocean, uh, it appears that in addition of iron, um, where there's plenty of nitrogen, plenty of phosphorus could boost productivity. But the assumption is that it would boost productivity in a way that would amp up the biological pump and then pull more carbon dioxide, not that 30-some percent, but maybe another 2 or 3 or 4 percent uh, out of the atmosphere. Um, th there have been many experiments attempting to, to uh, test that, and, and as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing that shows that it would really ever work on the scale that it would have to uh, if someone were to uh, seriously employ that. And then there's all the uncertainty about what that would do to the ecosystem that you're tampering with. So compared to the other things we could do, uh, from fuel efficiency to the shifts to renewables, all of which are not only um, far more practical and, 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 and being incorporated with speed that, that no one could have imagined just 10 years ago, uh, to imagine 10 years ago that you'd have uh, four states in the middle of this country right now that are more than 30% dependent upon wind energy for their electricity. You've got, you've got South Dakota, you've got Iowa, you've got Oklahoma, and Kansas, more than 30% of their electricity from wind. Or that you've got four states are getting more than 10% of their energy from, from solar. Uh, you have Hawaii, California, Arizona, and even Vermont. Um, <laughs> now, they don't use a lot of electricity in Vermont, but you get 10% from... So, so there are so many sensible things we could do, and to to insult the ocean in one additional way, hoping that that's going to save us, as I think, really absurd. We have a question. Yeah, I'm John Holdren, formerly President Obama's science advisor. Um, both of you, uh, Jim and Paul, gave us an extraordinary amount of insight in a mere ten minutes each into how uh, the oceans work, how life in the oceans work. But until we got to the Q&A, there was really no mention of the vulnerability of those processes to the changes that human activity are imposing on the oceans. In the Q&A, we've gotten around to mentioning uh, the warming of the oceans, acidification, uh, eutrophication, dead zones, overfishing, uh, plastic junk, toxification of the oceans. Uh, my question is, what, what are your best insights about the vulnerabilities of the processes you elucidated, the processes that are based on uh, microorganisms uh, and the very base of the food, food chain? Where are the vulnerabilities specifically to what we are imposing on the oceans? It's a very striking thing that as was observed actually several decades ago, the danger is that the power of civilization to disrupt natural systems has far outrun our understanding of the vulnerabilities of those natural systems, how they work, what we must avoid. So in terms of what you both described as the mechanisms, what is our current understanding of the vulnerabilities uh, to these multiple threats that we're imposing on the ocean? I think the first big problem we face is, as Jim just said, over 90% of the heat is absorbed in the ocean, but it's absorbed in the upper ocean primarily. And if you think about it, what this represents is an energy barrier between the nutrients which are in the deep ocean the, and the nutrient supply to the upper ocean, which is where they're needed by phytoplankton. So year over year over year, when we have satellite images of the chlorophyll concentrations of the ocean, and you start to look at the trend, you can see that there's a long-term trend, long-term meaning a decade and a half, that's a long term for us now, 
Um, it's very difficult to anneal satellite records from the late 1970s with the others. We try. Uh, but if we look at it, we see a long-term decline in upper ocean chlorophyll concentrations for sure. And we assume that is also related to a decline in upper ocean productivity. So where does this lead? It, it leads to a situation which uh, Jim showed in his slide where you have less, fewer nutrients, you're going to have smaller cells, you're going to have essentially fewer fish to take out of the ocean. You're going to have a weaker biological pump. Um, now, the long-term glide path out of this is going to take at, at least several hundred years. So this is the bad part, which I, you know, Kasha said we don't want to get depressed, but even if you turned off all of the carbon dioxide emissions magically today, we have built into the cake at least 0.2 to 0.3 degrees of warming because of the stored heat in the upper ocean. Um, and that's because we're not at equilibrium yet. So that's the equilibrium problem in climate. Uh, I, I'm just pointing this out because a lot of us in, 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 in Earth system science think about these problems very seriously. I, I take heart that we're not going to, the microbes are not going to go extinct, believe me. They're fine. Uh, it's, it's much more that humans are much more vulnerable to having massive problems of water supply in places where they need it and don't have it in food supply as a result of no water and massive migrations of people. And we, can, we already see that to some extent, but this is really where I find it a little bit horrifying that the Joint Chiefs of Staff presented to Congress climate change as being a long-term strategic threat to the nation. And this is only one part of it. But they understand that. I am just amazed that we have not yet taken their advice and taken the advice of 90, more than 97% of our scientists and developed policies in the United States that are leading the way rather than lagging. In our defense, John, we knew what the questions were going to be. So in our presentations, um, we'd set up the background, and 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 it's a it's a it's a terrific question. Um, uh, just amplifying a bit on what Paul said, uh, and one of the reasons it's difficult to establish these trends is there are internal cycles within the ocean, like the the El Nino cycle and the North Atlantic oscillation, and so on. So, so a, a ten or fifteen year record is 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 hard to use, and we need a longer record. But these trends that Paul said are really concerning. And the net effect of the warming, as he said, is, is going to result in a diminished intensity of that bloom process. And that bloom process is actually absolutely key driving the biological pump and taking carbon to the deep ocean, but also um, with respect to fish. And most people don't realize that 90% of the fresh fish, 90% of the fresh fish consumed on our planet today is consumed by in developing countries. That in many developing countries, more than half coastal countries uh, of the protein in the diet of, of, of people in those areas comes from a daily fish catch. And so with fewer nutrients, uh, you have um, coming to the surface ocean with a warmer surface, more stratification, and, and, and less of that intensification of the the deep nitrate upwelling, uh, you know, some suggestions that the North Atlantic circulation is slowing down. That's where that nitrogen comes from that drives the spring bloom of the North Atlantic. Um, there will be a diminished potential for uh, human nutritional benefit that today is extremely important. And then if you add to that uh, the ocean acidification and the effect on mollusk, um, many of the areas that are most affected by that now, the the larval mollusk, the larval oyster, um, can't make its first shell. So it's not the adult with a thinner shell. If you can't make the first shell, you'll never be an adult. So uh, th these are, I think, very serious concerns among ocean scientists today. 
Um, we're going to go on for another question or two, but if people need to leave to go back to work, you're allowed to. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. Uh, my name is Lee Yona. I'm a master's student, soon to be a PhD student. Depending on my academic audience, I say I'm either an ecologist or a political scientist studying soil carbon. Uh, and my question to both of you is, is looking forward, something I noticed for myself as a graduate student and in, with a lot of my classmates is that we are very excited about the research we do and contributing knowledge to you know, understanding environmental problems, but we also have a very hard time stopping there um, and feel, feel very much as though, Julia knows this, that this is the question I was going to ask, but <laughs> feel very much that we have to engage with policy in some way and dare I say advocacy. And I'm curious if um, any of you have thoughts on that or advice because academia in many ways is not encouraging of um, or, or really tolerant of engaging in policy work or advocacy work and how, if you have any advice on how to balance that for someone who's really concerned about our world um, and also trying to balance that research with that policy work. Well, it's a difficult question. I think the first order question to me in the global climate change issue and global change issues, you have three issues that are critical. One we haven't discussed at all, and that's human population increase. So we're living presently on about one and a half planets. This is a huge concern. The second one is energy supply, which is the number one cause of the increase in carbon dioxide and the driver. And what would you do first? And here, the worrying about whether you're going to get 28 miles per gallon or 29 miles per gallon or 30 miles per gallon is noise. The real, real issue here is how are you going to generate electricity? So that's the second issue. And then the third issue is much more subtle. And that is, as climate changes, habitability sections of the planet will change. So we already see this in the West. We see huge amounts of drought, and that the forecast is that will persist. So we will get rain where we don't want rain, or at least where I don't think we want rain, and you will not have rain where you want rain. And that's something that will change food supply, which is a huge, huge problem globally. So if I look back now, we have approximately 30 days of reserve food on the planet to feed, say, 300 million people if there's a huge drought. If you have 500 million people that are in a drought area in a year because of an El Nino effect, you have potentially 200 million people that will die. This is really, I mean, you, we really must not just advocate, we must think strategically about what are the problems and how can we solve them. And nobody, the elephant in the room, nobody wants to talk about is population. Um, the second big elephant in the room is how to build a way in developed and developing countries from the standard gas or coal or fired power plants on a grid, which is the way we built this in the United States, to microgrids or some other system that allows power to be re renewable. And then if you have power, if you have power and you have salt water, you can generate water. So Israel went from a country that was dependent on Lake Kinneret for its entire freshwater supply, and now it has desalination plants all along the coast. There's an abundance of water in Israel. So these are countries that have generated power and generated water and generated food. And that, that model can go on. It's not sustainable in the sense of the power supply yet. But I think we need to figure these things out strategically rather than just piecemeal. So this is really where many groups that Jim was in, Julia was in, so on, have thought about this for a long time. And, and it just hasn't yet 
penetrated with the United States Department of Energy, Department of State, Department of Defense, Department of Interior, to make a cohesive policy system. I, we, we could talk for hours about this. It's a very interesting problem. But let me come back to what I, I think maybe I understood to be the uh, focus of your particular concern, and, and that is around this word advocacy. And I think it's, it's often uh, used in a pejorative way, and, and um, that's unfortunate. Uh, maybe we need another word. But, but I like to think that all scientists should be advocate for the very best science uh, being available and accessible and to be part of the pr ourselves, part of the process of, of, that, of that availability uh, for decision makers. And, you know, Paul and I have colleagues uh, who um, would prefer not to respond to requests to appear before a congressional committee, for example, to talk about the ocean. They just, they, they, you know, it's not my thing, or, or I, I don't want to take tough questions. Uh, uh, but we all have a responsibility to do that. I think we all have a responsibility to, to, uh, to talk to the public, to accept invitations or local groups, and, and to help people who are politically inclined or motivated or connected to, to uh, gain access to the most uh, useful information for these purposes. And sometimes uh, advocacy groups have a very narrow agenda and they're gonna push it very hard and, 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 and maybe even in a way that ignores the best science. So I think, I think what we can do is, is help uh, and, and to be, make uh, the best information we have available uh, to that process. Yes, uh, we'll take you. It'll be the last question, so make it good, but no pressure. Okay, no pressure at all. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Evan Weber, and uh, yeah, thank you both very much for your legacy of work, and congratulations. Um, well deserved. Uh, so I uh, spent a lot of my time working with uh, young people around the country to uh, garner more public support for uh, stronger environmental and climate policies. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, you know, we spent a lot of our time sort of uh, uh, lamenting about uh, what the generation before us of environmentalists did wrong or could have done better. Uh, my combined conclusion from both of your presentations is that they at least got one demand right, which is save the whales, right? Um, so glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> but uh, my, my other question uh, based off of that is what are other... Uh, ocean policy solutions um, that can help us to uh, sustain the carrying capacity of the earth, particularly as it relates to um, climate change? Well, as I alluded to earlier, there is no international commission on fisheries that really has any authority to enforce the rules. And um, that would be one area which I think can be developed much better. There are people in the room here that are much more in, thoughtful about policy than I. Uh, Mike McCracken is here. John Holdren is here. Rush Holt is here. Uh, the ocean acidification story is, goes hand in hand with carbon dioxide emissions, so this is an energy problem. How do you, how do you get energy without burning fossil fuels? Uh, ocean thermal processes are, again, coupled to the same source of the problem, which is energy. Uh, the oceans will be here long after we're gone. And uh, I, I think the issue is here, who's really at risk? If I turn the problem around and I suggest that we are the fragile species, we're at risk as a species, then I think you could probably get a little more traction, uh, a little more attention than if you say, oh, I'm going to worry about polar bears. Most people in their lives will have never seen a live polar bear. They'll see one in a zoo. They'll see pictures of a polar bear. But the immediacy of that is a three-minute, maybe, interaction, and then they go off and do what they're going to do. I rather people think much more about what it is for their children's future. And I'll give you this because I was at an IGBP meeting years ago in, in Switzerland. 
And there was a social scientist from the Potsdam Institute who was there. And he made the following comment, which I thought was really interesting to me, sociologically. He said, in Germany, for example, when a parent thinks that they can save carbon by having a more efficient hot water heater or more efficient solar energy panels on their roof, they view that as helping their children. In the United States, there's no th regard on mass about being green as something for the future of your children. So this is a difference in the way the society views things and the penetration of this consciousness of what we do as individuals, what we do as society, really is a, a profound thing. I was talking to Rush earlier today. To my mind, one of the most interesting things we could do as scientists and policymakers is to inform eight and nine-year-old kids about science, about the world. By the time they're 16, it's too late. I'm serious. I, I think eight and nine-year-old kids are intellectually curious. They are they're desiring to understand who they are, what they can do, and how they can change you know, the way they, they, they understand the world is a little bit scary. So if we, if we could give them some sense of how they can become better citizens and more informed, I think we'll have made a great impact. I would start at the eight and nine-year-old kids. Well, I should say there, there's, there's a lot that AAAS can and is doing in this area, and I think the, the tagline of AAAS, advancing science and serving society, is just smack on. It's where uh, scientists should be focusing their effort these days. Um, in addition to uh, John and Mike McCracken, another person in this room who has wealth of experience in this dealing with these thorny problems is Bob Watson. And, and, and when you talk about humans as a fragile species, I mean, one of the most striking things that I remember for a lot of people uh, who we, uh, when we delivered our, our third assessment of the IPCC was, was the realization that um, there are vulnerable people uh, worldwide, and not only out there, over there, but close to here. There are vulnerable people in every population, and unfortunately there are clusters of, of certain nations in, in certain regions where this is really intense uh, who are going to be uh, most affected by these changes. And so um, the fragility is not, uh, is not spread in some nice, uh, smooth, democratic way. Uh, it's very uh, skewed, and the, the people who have the least resources ironically, to deal with this problem are some of the people who are going to be most affected. So I think that's, that's another perspective that we need to uh, convey is the responsibility uh, not just to uh, future generations in our bloodline, but, but globally where um, in many of those cases today, just eking out a daily existence is a difficult enough challenge, and, and that's going to be even harder in the future. I think that's been a really important message of the IPCC process. Thank you very much. Thank you for all those great qu questions. I, ha I have to say, I'm, I'm so glad that you've talked about other disciplines, the social sciences, and also the global view. We're all in this together. I liked what Pre President Macron said in, in, this, in Congress. There is no, I liked everything he said. Yes, I didn't want to be. But th there is no planet B. We're all in this together, and we're just going to have to Get everybody to understand that. So boundaries are man-made and, and artificial in this case. So we've got a lot of work to do, but you've given us great hope. And, and the good news is that we are able to, we're welcome, thank you, Rush, to stay here until 2.30. We have dessert outside and coffee, and we can continue these conversations. I think at 2.30 we would have to leave, but now I just want you to join me to thank our laureates, to be laureates this evening. <laughs>